Now for the uh, conference. We've got a great panel to kick things off and a terrific moderator to set the stage, keep us on topic and on time. Uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce in Grande Montréalaise uh, the Honorable Marlene Jennings. Ms. Jennings is known to many of you as the former Member of Parliament for the riding of Notre Dame de Grasse, La Chine, which she represented from 1997 to 2011. She's the first black Quebecer to be elected to Parliament, where she served as Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister, to the Solicitor General of Canada, and to the Minister for International Cooperation. As a member of the official opposition, she served as Deputy House Leader and Justice Critic. For close to two years, Ms. Jennings was Executive Director of the YMYWHA, the Montreal Jewish Community Centers, and she's also an active volunteer, first Vice President of the Mackay Rehabilitation Center's Board of Directors, member of the board of the Institut Universitaire de Gériat Gériatrie de Montréal, uh, and co-chair of the fundraising team of the Vanguard School's $4 million capital campaign. Bilingue, expérimenté, engagé, Ms. Jennings joins us today to chair our first panel, City Governance, the Mayor's Perspective. Marlene, over to you. I don't know if I'm going to give the mic up. <laughs> These days, I don't have very uh, many occasions to uh, speak uh, before a mic. Thank you, Anne, for that lovely introduction. C'est un grand plaisir pour moi d'être ici uh, cet après-midi. J'étais associé avec NISC 2011 à 2012 comme visiteur spécial, et j'ai eu le privilège de aider Will et uh, son équipe à organiser une, uh, la conférence annuelle de 2012 sur le, le crime. And I know a lot about that, starting from my early age. <laughs> Mais c'est également un plaisir de, de pouvoir modérer ce panel. We have a panel of five mayors of very diverse cities, but who have one thing in common. They're all mayors, they all have to answer to their citizens, and they all have the same preoccupations. I'm convinced of that. As um, uh, Principal Fortier mentioned, the topic of the MISS conference is addressing, is, is addressing this this year is particularly timely, and I'm confident that these panel members that I'm about to introduce to you will have plenty to say about it. I'm going to introduce the five mayors who represent cities from across Canada, large and small, in alphabetical order. And as I finish the introduction, I'm going to ask the mayor to take, take a seat. Just leave the um, third one and this one for me. And once I've completed the introduction, then I'm going to ask again the mayors in alphabetical order to come up to the podium to uh, give their presentation. And once the five presentations are completed, we will go to question period. I've got my questions. And because I've, I hold the mic, I get to ask some of my questions before you do. Alors, comme j'ai expliqué, je vais faire l'introduction, la, la présentation des cinq maires en ordre alphabétique. À chaque fois que je termine la présentation d'un maire, je, euh, je vais lui demander de prendre sa place. À la fin des cinq introductions, je vais demander encore en ordre alphabétique aux maires de faire votre, leur présentation. Et à la fin des présentations des cinq maires, nous allons passer aux périodes des questions. J'ai quelques questions pour euh, débuter cette période et par la suite je vais euh, lancer euh, le débat à tout le monde. So, to begin, Mayor Bonnie Crombie. <laughs> mayor Crombie is currently serving her first term as mayor of Mississauga, Ontario. She took over office from one Hazel McCallion, one of Canada's longest serving mayors. And although Mayor Crombie may be new to the role of mayor, she's not new to politics. 
She previously served as Councillor of Ward 5 of Mississauga, and before that, she was a federal MP for the riding of Mississauga Streetsville, and I had the honour and privilege of, of uh, working with Bonnie on Parliament Hill from 2008 to 2011, and we developed a friendship, and uh, it's never gone away. Mayor Mark Hayek. Mayor Hayek has been the mayor of Yellowknife since 2012. Prior to that, he served on the city council as both a councillor and as deputy mayor. He currently also serves as vice chair of the Cana Canadian Municipalities Green Municipal Fund Council. Mayor Hayek is familiar to McGill. He's uh, studying towards his BA in History and Canadian Studies. So it's quite appropriate for him to be asked to be part of the panel here by MISC for its annual conference. Mayor Dan Matheson. <laughs> Mayor Matheson is currently serving his first fourth term as Mayor of Stratford, an on Ontario town that has become synonymous with arts and culture throughout North America, but I think we could safely say internationally as well. In addition to his duties as Mayor of Stratford, Mayor Matheson also sits on numerous boards and committees in healthcare, municipal affairs, law enforcement, athletics, not-for-profits, universities and colleges, including King's University College at the University of Western Ontario and the advisory board of the University of Waterloo Stratford campus. Thank you for joining us. Mayor Mike Savage. Mayor Savage is the, Mike Savage is the mayor of Halifax Regional Municipality since 2012. Before becoming mayor, he served as a federal member of parliament for Dartmouth Coal Harbor, uh, serving on the House of Commons Standing Committee on Finance, Standing Committee on Health, and its Standing Committee on Human Resources, Social Development, and the Status of Persons with Disabilities. And he'll tell you that we spent a summer together <laughs> in hell. <laughs> we were part of a blue ribbon panel, working, theoretically working, with, at the time, Mayor Diane Finley, who was the mayor of um, Human Resources. Minister, yes. And, yeah, minister. And uh, Pierre Poiliev, who's recently been brought into cabinet as the mayor of, I think it's Human Resources, Skills Development. Minister. minister. You see, I have a problem there. My brain won't give them their proper title. They're both ministers, and we were supposed to be coming up with solutions to see that our employment insurance was actually as equitable as it could be across regions, across municipalities, across districts, um, and gender, etc. And for some reason, it just didn't work. And we, yeah, it was our fault. Yes, yes. A finalma. Oh, I did. Yes, I. Uh, and he's a past president of the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Nova Scotia. Mike, uh, Mayor Savage uh, remains active in many community organizations. Et non finalement, c'est un grand plaisir pour moi de vous présenter le, la mairesse de Châteauguay, Nathalie Simon. <applaudissements> Élue depuis novembre 2009 au poste de mairesse, elle est également préfète de la municipalité régionale de Comet de Roussillon. Elle occupe la vice-présidence de la Commission environnement de la Communauté métropolitaine de Montréal, la vice-présidence de la Régie intermunicipale de valorisation des matières organiques de Beauharnois de Salaberry et de Russion, et elle est membre du Conseil intermunicipal de transport du Sud-Ouest parmi ses, ses nombreux rôles dans la communauté. Merci d'être avec nous, um, Mairesse Simon. And now I'd like to just kick this off before I ask each one to come for their presentation by giving you a little flavor of what the weather's like today in Canada. 
Mayor Crombie, it's now minus 17 Celsius in Mississauga, but it feels like minus 28. Mayor Hayek, surprisingly, it's only minus 16 Celsius and only feels like minus 22. And I learned something. There's actually less snow in Yellowknife because it's an arid reason, region. So that was my new piece of knowledge today. Thank you. M Mayor Matheson, it's minus 16 in Stratford, feels like minus 26. Mayor Savage, it's minus 2 feels like minus five. Oh. Et, et finalement, la mairesse de Châteauguay, au Châteauguay, Château c'est moins 12, ça sent comme si c'était moins 22. Uh -huh. Oui. Montreal, on the other hand, is only minus nine and only feels like minus 14. So we do not bad today. And with that, I will ask Mayor Crombie to come and take the floor. So it's positively balmy in Halifax and coldest, I guess, in Mississauga. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. J'aimerais vous remercier pour cette invitation aujourd'hui. Um, I'm going to limit my remarks to English. I think my French is a little bit rusty. But I want to thank the McGill Institute, Miss, for having me today and for uh, introducing this topic on the cities that we need. What I think I'll do is I'll talk a little bit, set the scene for you, describe Mississauga and how wonderful a city we are, what a great city we are, and then talk a little bit about our challenges, and I'll try and do that all in about 38 minutes. Right, that's how much I get. <laughs> Just kidding. Eight minutes. Got it. Got it. Got it. So, what do you say about a city who was led by an icon of a woman who was revered around the world, beloved by everyone, voted the second most popular mayor in the world, Hazel McCallion, known as a force of nature, the hurricane, and to be her predecessor, to be that person selected, um, or successor rather, to be that person elected following her has been truly an honor and a pleasure. She uh, governed Mississauga with a velvet glove for. 36 years and just celebrated her 94th birthday last week. And I say that to set the stage because really Mississauga grew and developed under her vision and under her image and we're very grateful to her. We all love and adore Hazel but um, um, I'm delighted that she decided to retire and given me the opportunity to carry that torch. We are Canada's sixth largest city with a population of 750,000 people. Dynamic, diverse and vibrant city. 56% of our population was born somewhere else outside North America. The top five languages we speak and Chinese is number one. If you include both Mandarin and Cantonese, you combine them. Then Urdu, Punjabi, a Polish, and Arabic. Those are our top five languages, but it goes down from there with Portuguese and Filipino, Tagalo, and et cetera. We speak everything under the sun. We're strategically located next to our south uh, southeastern suburb called a little city called Toronto. You may have heard of them. Uh, we're 90 minutes from the U.S. border as well. And we have changed the landscape of Mississauga from pastoral setting to really iconic. Uh, we have a dense downtown full of condominiums. And maybe you've seen our, our iconic Marilyn Monroe Towers, really quite swervy. They're very beautiful. And they've really changed the face of uh, the postcard that is the G the greater Toronto area. We are ranked the number one mid-sized city, the sixth largest in Canada, and the 24th largest in North America. We're a world-class city made up of a highly educated workforce that speaks over 200 different languages, over 66%, over two-thirds of our population has a post-secondary degree, and 22%, so just almost a quarter or highly educated engineering or architecture related skills. So very highly educated workforce. Last week I had the privilege of passing my first budget, almost $700 million, $700 million both cap capital and operating, but we're two-tier government, so this is the city's portion. Uh, on, the, on the regional portion, which, in, which was $2 billion, um, our, our, percent, our portion of that is about 60%, so my, my budget is almost $2 billion. And at the region, um, we look at public works, waste management and police services. We also have a AAA credit rating. Um, the tax impact on, um, on our citizens is this year, I'm quite proud to say, 1.3%. 
the city's portion, the region's portion is 0.9. So the impact to the taxpayer in Mississauga this year is 2.2%. And that allows me to keep my very first campaign commitment from last October, keeping our tax increases to the rate of inflation. So I'm very proud of that. It does allow our residents to manage their budgets. We even, I'm very proud to say, we found $6 million in savings. Um, through a process called Lean, which asks everyone to be a little more efficient and go back and take a look at how they can do things a little better with a little less money. And that equates to almost 2% on the tax bill had that $6 million been still been in the budget. Uh, we are a leading destination for foreign direct investment. Um, our GDP is $40 billion. We have 60,000 businesses in Mississauga, 60,000, 63 Fortune 500 companies, and we are a net importer of jobs. I know once upon a time we were a very sleepy suburb, and everyone in Mississauga grew up as a, as a, as a bedroom community for the city of Toronto, and people drove out, and we were designed for cars, wide boulevards, cars to drive to Toronto. Now more people from Toronto and beyond drive into Mississauga to work. Either we start and end our day in Mississauga or people drive in to work. And as a result, we're home of six, six Fortune uh, 400 series highways and also home to Pearson International Airport, which is the Mississauga-based airport, Mississauga's international airport. And job creators choose us because of our highly educated workforce. And we're also home to University of Toronto's Mississauga campus and the business school at Sheridan College. We have un unrivaled quality of life, great place to live, work, raise your family. Uh, we have higher than average couples and nine community centers, just to put things in perspective, 225 kilometers of trails, 25 ice pads, 11 indoor or outdoor pools, um, 22 kilometers of shoreline and 240 kilometers of bike lanes. Cycling is a big pastime. We have four active business improvement areas and we are known as the festival city. We have Festivals, uh, we have cultural festivals such as Carasaga, Waterfront Festival, Southside Shuffle, Comedy Fests, and Canada Day. We have great creative spaces, Celebration Square, our Living Arts Centre, outdoor cafes, and wonderful public art. We do require new, new developments to dedicate a portion of their development towards an item of public art. So we have great um, sculptures in front of buildings, we have carved trees, we have um, unicorns, piano keys, we have wonderful, wonderful public art. It's a priority for us in Mississauga. Arts and culture is a very, um, th is thriving. Uh, we have a very highly talented arts and culture community in Mississauga. But we are 41 years old this year, so we are facing the same challenges other three minutes, all right, um, I'm getting there. Uh, other cities our size are, are facing. Um, and I am delighted to work with the big city mayors of FCM, Federation of Canadian Municipalities, uh, across Canada to work to advocate to the federal government on our priorities, which include, and I think this will be similar for all the mayors here on this panel, dedicated and predictable funding for our public transit and for our infrastructure, our infrastructure, our roads, our bridges, our sewers. The number one issue when you ask the big city mayors is public transit and investing in public, public transit and in infrastructure. And that is the same for me and I'm sure many of the mayors here. I'd be very interested to see how that differs from the larger communities to the smaller ones. Also for me, um, um, challenges is the opportunity to generate economic um, development and create jobs. As I told you in the 70s and the 80s, we were subject to urban sprawl, but of course we were. It, it was the architectural design of the day. We had cheap land and oil was cheap. So we built a community around a car. We built the dream home. We built the, uh, you know, the picket fence community with large homes, wide boulevards, wide streets. So our first challenge, of course, is combating congestion and gridlock because you can't get through or you can't navigate our streets. Um, people spend an average of 90 minutes commuting and it impacts our GDP to the tune of $6 billion a year to our economy. So I have plans to build light rail transit. It's a $1.6 billion investment and commitment. Uh, we are focused on regionally integrated transit along with the City of Toronto and Brampton, um, and that's where we're looking to coordinate. With, um, we're building RER, Regional Express Rail, and my priority 
is um, all day two way go trains. This is the rapid transit, uh, RER, regionally express rail, throughout the city of Mississauga after we build our light rail transit. And we have lobbying heavily the provincial and the federal government. I'm getting, I've just got, to, I'll just be brief. Uh, two other challenges smart growth. How do we build that livable, walkable community after have been known as the city of sprawl? So smart growth, how to protect and preserve our distinct communities, because after all, we are a city that we're small towns and villages came together to build our great city. Um, and as you know, the streets were designed for cars, which can be very isolating with the wide boulevards and the cul-de-sacs. So these are the opportunities. How do we urbanize? How do we intensify without losing our identity as small villages and towns? And then finally, economic development. We're, we don't have developable land anymore. We're not building out as we had been. We're building up. So we are going through urbanization, intensification. Um, but as a result, our DCs, our development charges that we use to fund our economy are dwindling. So we need other sources of revenue and we need that dedicated revenue, but we need to do that through economic development as well. And so I'm looking for, to develop an, a, an international investment advisory panel to look for, for more foreign in direct investment from abroad. We just made a $10 million commitment, a million a year for 10 years to UTM's innovation complex because we want to position ourselves very much as a hub of innovation and entrepreneurship going forward. And of course, we need to build infrastructure because how else um, do you build your economy if you don't have the basics right? And that is through your infrastructure, through the transit that we need. So once again, we have an excellent high quality of life, a highly educated workforce, a desirable place to locate businesses, the 60,000 that are there, um, and a very strong economic base. So that gives you, paints you a little bit of a picture of Mississauga, what our city looks like today and what our challenges are going forward. So thank you again for the invitation. It's great to see great colleagues here. Thank you, Mayor Crombie. And now I'd like to ask uh, Mayor Mark Haycheck to come up. I trust Mayor Crombie's time didn't eat into mine. Uh, no. First off, I have to apologize to Mayor Crombie when people have been asking me how did I get to Montreal. I've been telling them I flew through Toronto. In fact, I guess I flew through Mississauga. So I will uh, we'll keep that in mind in the future. Um, it's a real honor to, to be here and to be a part of this conference. As, uh, as Marlene mentioned, uh, I spent a few years here at McGill several years ago, uh, part of which was with MISC. So it's, it's fantastic to be able to come back and to share a little bit about Yellowknife with, with all of you. Uh, I can say with a fair degree of certainty that I would probably not be in the position I'm in now were it not for my time here at, at McGill and at MISC. Uh, it, it had such a great deal to do with forming my worldview of things that, um, you know, I just, I don't think I would be where I am uh, without, without that experience. To start, I wanted to give uh, a brief history and kind of set the context of Yellowknife for those of you who may not be familiar with our community. Uh, Yellowknife was established as a settlement in 1934, shortly after gold was discovered in the region, and it grew up around two gold mines that we found within our municipal boundary for uh, decades after that. We became an incorporated municipality in 1953, and 1967, Yellowknife became the capital of the Northwest Territories when the seat of the territorial government actually moved from Ottawa uh, to the Northwest Territories. Prior to that, the Territorial Council, as it was called, was actually appointed by the federal government, sat and conducted its business in Ottawa, governing the landmass that we, we now know as the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Northwest Territories. For many decades, we prospered from gold. Uh, the gold mines actually what brought my family to, to Yellowknife. Uh, but in the 90s, we started to see gold production decline. And we were very fortunate that during that same period, uh, diamonds were discovered several hundred kilometers north of Yellowknife. So just as the gold was declining, the diamonds came on board. Uh, but we saw a shift in the dynamic in the type of economic activity and the type of employment that created. Uh, because these mine sites are about 300, 350 kilometers away from Yellowknife, you have two week rotations where people go in for two weeks and come out for two weeks. And in the, diamond, in the gold mine days, basically everybody that worked at those mines lived in Yellowknife. Whereas uh, with the diamond mines, you can have people living in just about any corner of, of Canada and then coming back to work for, uh, for their two weeks. Today we're approximately, uh, we're a city of approximately 20,000 people and a very diverse community. Uh, we have 
probably about 120 nationalities represented within our small community. Uh, one of my favorite duties as mayor is attending citizenship ceremonies. And we had one a few months ago where 130 new Canadians from 39 different countries were sworn in in Yellowknife, and it's a, it's a heartwarming experience. I should also mention that uh, Yellowknife has one of the highest household incomes of any city in Canada, uh, possibly only surpassed by Fort McMurray. And given what's happening with oil these days, that could very well change quite soon. So uh, to those of you in the room who may be nearing graduation and looking for uh, employment opportunities, I encourage you to uh, take a look at what Yellowknife has to offer. I think through some of the questions that we'll discuss today, a lot of the challenges that are common to all, all municipalities will come out. Uh, certainly affordable housing, infrastructure, public transit, those are things that affect all communities. But uh, in this, this presentation, I wanted to touch on a few of the things that are perhaps unique to uh, northern and remote communities in terms of the challenges that they pose. Uh, Yellowknife sits within an unsettled land claim area. Uh, in the Northwest Territories, the northern half of the NWT is virtually all settled, uh, has settled land claims. But the area around in Yellowknife and around Yellowknife is unsettled, which creates a lot of uncertainty uh, from an economic development perspective, but also from the perspective of the Yellowknife's Dene, Dene First Nations, which have uh, inhabited that region for thousands of years. Uh, we find it difficult to work with our territorial government in acquiring land as these negotiations are ongoing because they're very reluctant to dispose of land to the city uh, while they're in the midst of negotiations. So for uh, planning for future residential or commercial or industrial uh, growth, uh, we're quite hamstrung in acquiring the land that we need to, to be able to plan for that properly. One of the other big challenges that we face, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, Yellowknife was founded on two gold mines. Well, one of those mines went out of commission in 1999, the other in 2003. And so we have huge quantums of land within our municipal boundary uh, that were used for decades for industrial purposes uh, that are virtually unusable to us now. Uh, one of those in particular that some of you may be familiar with is called Giant Mine. And the owners of Giant Mine over the years, uh, because we sit on the Greenstone Belt on the Canadian Shield, uh, that's a very rich, uh, the, the minerals are very rich in arsenic. And the process that they used at this one particular mine to process the ore uh, was they put it into what's called a roaster. And in that process, a chemical change occurs where one of the byproducts is arsenic trioxide. Well, for decades, they took this arsenic trioxide and piped it back underground into the mined out stokes to the point where in 1999 when uh, Royal Oak was the last company to own that mine, when they declared bankruptcy and walked away um, scot-free, uh, we have now 237,000 tons of tri arsenic trioxide uh, stored underground at that mine. Uh, and then basically the federal and, and territorial governments have been left holding the bag for the cleanup. So again, that's a, that's a big challenge for us and we need to figure out what, if anything, can we do with these huge quantums of land that, uh, that sit within our municipal boundary. One of the other big things, I think this will this will certainly come out in the discussion today, um, is is you know the overarching question for this session is what 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 are what are the cities that we need look like, and what powers do cities need to to advance their interest and to advance the you know the vast majority of of citizens in this country who live in in urban areas. Um, in our context, in the Northwest Territories, uh, we are governed by a piece of legislation called the Cities, Towns, and Villages Act. And essentially, we have to work and operate under the same rules uh, that apply not only to the city of Yellowknife, but to villages of three or 400 people. And it makes it very difficult for us, where we have a much greater capacity to, to uh, carry out the interests of our citizens and further the interests of our citizens to do those things when we have to go cap in hand to the territorial government uh, time and time again for the smallest things that we need. Uh, so that's something that, you know, certainly there are uh, municipalities in Canada, Toronto being a, a good example, uh, that have advanced their interests with their respective provincial governments to put in place the legislation that allows them to uh, more flexibility and freedom to do what they need to do. We also face a major political challenge in that in our uh, legislative assembly, in the Territorial Legislative Assembly, Yellowknife, which is approximately half the population of the Northwest Territories, only has about a third of the representation in that legislature. And so we face a constant challenge just politically at the territorial level in advancing the interests of our community when we face pushback on anything that appears to be uh, good for or slanted towards, towards our city. And that's something that we actually, we had an Electoral Boundaries Commission uh, last year, and our legislature, unfortunately, is the one that decides 
what the actual electoral boundaries are going to look like, which to me seems like a bit of a conflict of interest. Uh, but they've decided to stick with the status quo, so we're actually contemplating a court challenge right now uh, under certain sections of the Constitution to see whether or not they can do that. Lastly, one of the big, big challenges we face is climate change. And that's certainly common to communities across uh, Canada, but manifests itself in different ways. Often when we talk about climate change, in the past anyway, in Yellowknife, people would scoff a little bit and say, well, you know, if it goes up to minus 30 in the winter from minus 35, then I'm okay with that. This past summer, some of you may, see, may have seen the news about the forest fire season we experienced in the Northwest Territories, where uh, there were a greater surface area of forest fires burning in the Northwest Territories just this summer than in Can the average of Canada as a whole over the past 10 years. Uh, we had 3 million hectares burn. Uh, we had a relatively small fire of about 20,000 hectares that was about 30 kilometers away from Yellowknife. And depending on the weather conditions, could have changed at any moment and put our community in danger. So that really, I think, brought home to us some of the, the very, very tangible uh, effects of climate change and how potentially devastating it can be. And that's something now we are, while we've had success in, in climate change mit uh, mitigation in the city of Yellowknife, we now have to take a much harder look at adaptation and how we're going to uh, change the way we do things to prepare for perhaps more frequent events like that in the future. I'll just end with, with a, an opportunity that we see. Uh, certainly the, the government of Canada over the last few years has put a much greater emphasis on Arctic sovereignty. And that's a, that's a discussion that we, we need to have as a country. Uh, the, the current thinking uh, at the federal level, anyway, appears to take more of a militaristic approach to what Arctic sovereignty means to, uh, to them and how they're going to exert Arctic sovereignty. For communities in the north, we know that we need to have strong, viable, healthy communities where we actually occupy the North uh, to, to exert that sovereignty and express that sovereignty. So I look forward to the discussion today with my, uh, my fellow mayors. And once again, it's, it's wonderful to be back here and part of this event. Thank you. And now, Mayor Don Matheson. Don't worry, Marlene, I can keep time. I have a Blackberry. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a privilege to be here at MISC and uh, an honor for me. Uh, I've uh, grown up in Stratford as a lifelong resident. Uh, Stratford was first settled in 1832, incorporated in 1854. It sits in southwestern Ontario, about an hour and 20 minutes uh, from Mississauga. We'll do that now that's the center of the universe since Bonnie told us that. And, uh, and what we've found in Stratford being a predominantly rural community, surrounded by the county of Perth, which is the most agriculturally productive county in the country. Almost $2 million a day in farm gate receipts come from the communities surrounding Stratford, and of course the services in Stratford are used for that. And with it, we have this iconic Stratford Festival, founded in 1953, that produces 3,000 jobs directly and indirectly and $140 million of GDP each and every year. And for those in government, $65 million of taxation. So imagine a community that's been able to blend arts at that level, an international level, with agriculture to such a degree. Number one in pork, two in dairy, two in chickens, and third in cash crops across the country. So it is a very eclectic mix of economic sectors. And as I said, Stratford was founded in the 1850s. And in the 1880s, the Grand Trunk Railway had the largest rail facility in North America in Stratford repairing and building locomotives. And through the 1800s, late 1800s into the early 1900s, Stratford thrived as a railway community. And in 1904, Canadian Pacific wanted to build a rail yard down at the river to add a second rail facility to Stratford. And at the time, a visionary businessman by the name of R. Thomas Orr said we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't take up our river valley and we shouldn't turn it into what would probably be a brownfield today. And Mr. Orr, with a series of gentlemen, bought up the land around and turned it over to the city and created the Stratford Parks Board. Now, I'll tell you why that's visionary. Because in 1904, to say no to the railway, but to say yes to quality of life, was something of pure vision. Fifty years later, the Stratford Festival opened up in that very parkland today. Stratford boasts that it has the largest parkland per capita of any community in the country. And people like R. Thomas Orr helped us understand 
that quality of life had to be part of our cities as they developed. And as we went through the 19, early 1900s into the 1920s, we had 15% of all furniture manufactured in Canada was made in Stratford. And that was great. So we had the railway, we had a way to ship the furniture that was made, and we set it off. And as like all communities, through the 30s, we suffered greatly through the Depression and through the war years, many of our factories turned to make, of course, uh, different things that were needed for war effort. And we came out in the 19. 40s and into the 1950s, Stratford with a proximity of three hours to Windsor, two hours to Buffalo, the rail yards in the city, it looked like it was going to be a boon time for Stratford to become a branch plant for U.S. facilities. But the railway told the city fathers at the time there was 20,000 people in Stratford, 2,000 of them worked in the railway, 10%, that they were leaving. They were closing up the shop and they were going away. So you can imagine the panic and fear in a community of our size, 32,000 people now, 20,000 then, of what do you do with a community that's losing 10% of their, of their economic base? Well, I can tell you the gentleman by the name of Tom Patterson had this neat idea, and that was if you give me $125, Stratford City Council, I'm going to go to New York, and I'm going to meet up with Sir Alec Guinness and Tyrone Guthrie. I'm going to stay at the Algonquin Hotel, and I'm going to convince them to come to Stratford and start a theater arts program in the park for six weeks every summer. Will you give me the money? And it's interesting to tell you that the mayor at the time, Wolf Gregory, who passed away a couple of years ago at the age of 99, said, do you know why, Dan, we gave him the money? We were scared. Nobody else had an idea. So we gave Tom the 125 bucks, sent him off to New York, and figured he'd never, ever make it happen. And he did. Because people believed that, you know what? You've got a plan. I don't have one. And two... We dreamed about a vision, and he executed on it. And I've told you the economic benefits of it. So through the 50s, as the theater started up, we did see great expansion into the automotive sector and the building of facilities, manufacturing within our community. And Stratford, again, continued to roll along well. The railway became a footnote in our history, but an important part of why we are resilient as a community. And through the 1980s, we saw the suffering of many manufacturing jobs through the decline in the early 80s. Furniture manufacturing left Stratford altogether in the late 80s, early 90s, putting people out of work. And we doubled down into the automotive sector. We brought in some more jobs, and things seemed good. Things seemed okay. People were happy. But through the 1990s, 1997, as a matter of fact, Stratford City Council struck a plan called 2010 and Beyond. 2010 and Beyond called for Stratford to be an international destination combining industry and arts, post-secondary education, and understanding quality of life is key to the development of communities. Over the next 15 years, almost 18 now, through that time period, we've enjoyed expansion. We have the lowest unemployment as of December in the province of Ontario. We were at 3.6%. We have embraced the digital media school from the University of Waterloo, thanks to one of the great mentors of this country and our Governor General David Johnston and his vision of combining arts and artists and global business together, understanding that content will rule the internet now and in the future. And we started with that school. Stratford took the government of Ontario policy of smart meters and put ubiquitous Wi-Fi over the entire city. We actually have a, a Wi-Fi net or mesh covering the entire city of Stratford. We have our own internet service providing because we understand digital inclusion is going to be important for our communities to develop. 2011, 12, and 13, we've been ranked as one of the top seven communities in the world by the Intelligent Community Forum out of New York, over 400 communities surveyed for being one of the top seven communities in the world dealing with economic, social, technology, educational, and healthcare development. So we're very proud of that. Now, what are our challenges going forward? Well, our challenges are like everybody else. There's a widening gap between those that have and those that don't. And we as a community need to understand that. We need to make sure that we don't leave people behind. So affordable and public social housing are important. Much like others, our problem with public transit is vias forgot about us. At one time we had six trains a day, we're down to two. Highway development money is only spent in the GTA, and you tend to forget that if we don't have cities, farmers that feed cities, we don't have cities. And we need to make sure we do that. We need to make sure that we continue to understand the quality of life is what matters for people today and should matter in the future for where we live, raise our families, and do business. 
People with the internet today can do business anywhere. You can study in Yellowknife at McGill, you can do business with somebody in Europe, and you can talk to your friends in Japan. We cannot forget that small communities have a part in this country's development, and that we cannot become homogenous, believing that everybody lives in a large urban center. The challenge that is before MISC over the next two days and over this country for the next number of years is how we not leave anyone behind in this country. And we celebrate the diversity of the people from coast to coast. And in Stratford, we're proud to say we play our part on an international level in the development of this great country. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mayor Matheson. And now I'd invite Mayor Savage to come to the floor. Eight minutes. Thank you very much, Marlene. Thank you, Mist, for putting this on. I'm really pleased to be here. Je suis très heureux d'être ici avec vous, avec mes colleagues. It's exciting. And uh, I just make one note that I've had a chance to participate in a few mayor's panels in the last year or so. I was in Norway. I was in Germany. I was in Houston. And the further you are from, from your own city, the more you can boast about it and nobody can question. So Montreal and Halifax are too close uh, for us to boast too much. But... It's very important to be here. You know, it's funny, I used to be an MP, and I'd kind of always seen myself as an MP. I'd never seen myself as a municipal politician until this opportunity in Halifax came along. I had the great pleasure of working with Bonnie and Marlene and others in the, in the House of Commons. So I'm the mayor of Halifax, which is Canada, Atlantic Canada's largest city. We're also uh, physically the largest municipality in the country. We're the only city that's actually bigger than a province. We're bigger than Quebec. No, not Quebec, PEI. <laughs> Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about Halifax, but I do want to address this issue of what the cities need, what the Canadian cities need. And I want to go through a few characteristics of what I think uh, Canada's cities need. So first of all, um, being mayor and being MP are different. Uh, being mayor is harder work. Municipal politics is harder. It's tougher. It's a grind. It's a slog. But it is, in, without question, better. So first of all, I want to talk about Ottawa. I was an MP in Ottawa. I want to show you a, a, a clip, direct clip from the House of Commons. This is, uh, this is a still shot from question period. You might notice Marlene Jennings with the paint uh, in, the, uh, in the front. In Ottawa these days, uh, politics is a pitched battle with your fellow warriors. You put your war paint on, absolutely convinced that you're right. All the policy is determined behind closed doors by a small leadership group, private focus groups, spin doctors, communications to people. And it's bought out in a lump and said, this is the policy of the government, the government loves it, the opposition hates it. Uh, you're all good soldiers, and everybody in the House of Commons is convinced that they're fighting for freedom. Now, municipal is different. This is municipal politics. <laughs> it's out in the open. It's slogging through debates. It's finding your words in the moment, sometimes to regret them. It's messy. It's raw. It's real. Consensus can be difficult, time-consuming, and frustrating. But the results are real, because the secret ingredient to all of the things in cities is not transit, it's not houses, it's not parks, it's people. The people have always been at the heart of cities, going back to Plato, to Shakespeare, and beyond. And cities which were once the causes of, of uh, disease, the spread of disease, atrocious living standards, cities in the last number of years have led to innovation, modern medicine, sanitation, building and labor codes. And the cities that we need, those that are livable, those that are inclusive and sustainable and vibrant, need the right tools, legislatively, financially, democratically, to help them meet their potential. Extensive public engagement, live streamed meetings, online input, Twitter hashtags, all of those things are very, very important. Halifax is a population of about 415,000 people with a diversified economy. We have six universities, a dynamic community college. We have the second best natural harbor in the world behind only Sydney, Australia. Part of the Atlantic Gateway, we have an award-winning airport. We have oil and gas exploration. Once again, uh, major oil companies, two of them investing a billion dollars. And we have the uh, shipyard, the Irving Shipyard, which is a $26 billion, the largest procurement, defense procurement in the history of the country. Uh, they'll be cutting steel uh, this fall. So we have a lot of uh, opportunities. Our economy is pretty good. We've reduced taxes. We've reduced the tax rate, both commercially and residentially, the last two years. But one thing about municipal politics, every time you help somebody, you hurt somebody else. 
At least people are perceived to be hurt. So how do you do it? The cities that we need, what are the characteristics? They must be collaborative with other levels of government, with their citizens, with labor, with business. We have to create the climate in which people come together through good urban design, streets, sidewalks, transit, parks, public buildings. Cities that we need must be innovative. This is a hackathon that I attended last year. Have any of you been to a hackathon? How many of you have been to a hackathon? Yeah, I thought it was where you went to get bronchitis. It's not. It's uh, actually very interesting. Uh, through technology, the public Wi-Fi that was talked about, open data apps and things like that, putting information in the palms of our citizens is very important. Last year, this last week, in fact, Halifax won an award at FCM meeting for Solar City, promoting the use of solar energy. Um, these are the kind of things. And when it comes to information, we need to be open. You have to trust citizens with the information that they have. This is our new central library, which CNN identified in December as one of the top 10 new buildings in the world, embodying a shift in thinking. It's been named an architectural marvel. Beautiful design, public spaces, but more than anything else, it's where people come together to share ideas, knowledge, and things like that. Cities must be dynamic. So this last year, we got rid of our 20-year-old logo of a lighthouse, and we bought forward a new brand, and it pissed off a lot of people but it was the result of 20,000 people being involved in the engagement. It's critical that Halifax stand a bit taller. Cities need to be leaders. In Nova Scotia, our economy is struggling. Last year, a report came out on the, hist on the state of our economy. It was called the Now or Never Report. And Halifax needs to take a leadership position in making sure that we be part, in a non-arrogant way. We're 45% we're, we're of the population of the province. We're 60% of the GDP. We also need uh, to be open. So this is an international student's reception. Uh, last year, the first time we did one in Halifax to try to uh, welcome students to uh, Halifax. We're, we've uh, passed a resolution at council. We want permanent residents to be able to vote in Halifax in municipal elections. That's pissed off a lot of people too, but it's absolutely the right thing to do, and more and more cities are going to be calling for this. Cities need to be partners. Uh, we need to be partners with other levels of government. We have a city charter in Halifax, the only one in Atlantic Canada. It's meant to be a, uh, sort of an enabling document. In fact, it's more enslaving. We have to go hands and knees to the provincial government to get the things that we need to make the changes that we want. But cities also need to be democratic. And cities can't be the chronic complainers of confederation. We can't go to the feds in the province all the time. Marlene's giving me the finger. You can't go to the feds and the province all the time and say we want money, we want power, unless you're going to give something back. Cities must be democratic. Here's my closing pitch. Where is there good public dialogue in Canada right now, politically? House of Commons? Is that good? The legislature? Talk shows? Online chats? Even social media? It's all about I'm right, you're wrong, I'm smart, you're stupid, get out of my way. Democratically, cities have the opportunity where real ideas can be discussed. It's not easy. It was never meant to be easy. It's tough. But if we build the cities that we need, we'll build the country that we need, and we'll do it democratically. Thank you, Mike. Et maintenant, j'aimerais demander à la mairesse Simon de venir au podium. Et on... Huit minutes. <laughs> Bon après-midi, good evening, distingués collègues. Un salut particulier aux organisateurs de cet événement et euh, je vous dirais que la gouvernance est un exercice bien complexe et je suis heureuse d'avoir été invitée pour en parler. Je suis partisane de la démocratie participative. Pour moi, gouverner veut dire avoir les mains sur le gouvernail, mais pas pour le tourner à droite, à gauche, à ma guise ou encore faire demi-tour, mais pour bien garder le cap sur l'objectif que nous nous sommes collectivement donné. Ainsi, l'important demeure la destination et non plus le capitaine qui est à la barre. Gouverner ainsi demande un travail de tous les instants, celui d'accompagner l'équipage pour qu'il rame dans la même direction. Il faut aussi être en mesure de prendre rapidement les décisions qui s'imposent pour éviter les écueils, acheter les vivres ou l'équipement nécessaire, choisir l'itinéraire. Les élus municipaux sont les plus près des citoyens. Les villes sont les lieux où tout se réalise. Et pour avoir des villes qu'il nous faut, il est plus que temps pour elles d'obtenir le statut de gouvernement de proximité. Voici donc Châteauguay, sur la rive sud de Montréal. 
une banlieue type de la grande région de, de Montréal. 80 de la population qui travaille sur l'île de Montréal, qui emprunte donc le pont Merci en grande partie pour se rendre sur l'île. Une population 60 francophone, 28 anglophone et euh, 12 allophone. Donc, euh, et de plus en plus, les allophones prennent euh, euh, de l'expansion, de la place, mais en fait, on les accueille et on est bien heureux de cette multiculturalité. Notre objectif, c'est de passer de ville banlieue dortoir à une ville dynamique attractive, attractive où il fait bon vivre, travailler et grandir. Notre plus grand défi, c'est d'arriver à atteindre cet objectif à travers les cadres législatifs, réglementaires, les politiques, les plans d'action, les décrets. Bref, à travers les visions et parfois l'absence de vision des niveaux fédéral, provincial, métropolitain, régional. Plus la machine est grosse et, et moins elle se retourne facilement. Alors, le message se rend difficilement de la toute petite poupée russe à la grande poupée. Des fois, le son se rend pas jusqu'en haut et on doit passer tous les, toutes les étapes, alors que de l'autre côté... Le son ra descend rapidement et les choses tombent rapidement dans notre cours sans qu'on nous ait jamais consulté ou demandé quoi que ce soit. C'est ainsi que la Ville se retrouve prise entre les besoins exprimés par ses citoyens, leurs souhaits, leur mécontentement et les contraintes qui proviennent des gouvernements supérieurs, leurs lois parfois obsolètes, voire archaïques, toujours contraignantes, leurs politiques et leurs plans d'action remplis de bonnes intentions et d'objectifs louables. La plus grande difficulté étant sans nul doute l'absence de cohésion, de cohérence, de synergie entre plusieurs des niveaux décisionnels. Et comme les villes sont l'endroit où tout se réalise, nous voilà aux prises avec l'obligation de livrer la marchandise sans que les moyens pour ce faire ne suivent la commande. Alors, on parlait tout à l'heure de transports en commun, de logements sociaux, on parle également de tout ce qui est de le développement, l'aménagement du territoire, la qualité de vie, le développement industriel, économique, commercial, le soutien aux organismes, à tout ce qui est organisme de santé sur le territoire, tout ça se retrouve chez nous. Et quand nous, on veut bouger, eh bien, on est obligé de demander la permission pour faire un emprunt, la permission pour baisser une limite de vitesse, la permission pour aller... Euh, développer, conserver les, conserver les milieux naturels. Donc, euh, tout se fait. Nous, on doit toujours demander et on se fait toujours euh, imposer. Alors, ne serait-ce qu'une compagnie de télécommunication qui veut installer une antenne, c'est un dossier que je connais très bien, qui veut en, installer une antenne sur le territoire, pas besoin de permis, pas besoin de demander la permission à la municipalité. On s'entend avec un propriétaire qui a un terrain assez grand. On installe une, une, une antenne sans savoir au préalable regarder euh, quelles étaient les prévisions d'aménagement du territoire de la municipalité. Et tout ça avec la bénédiction d'Industrie Canada qui a donné le permis à la compagnie de s'installer. Une loi qui date du télégraphe. Voilà donc... Euh, quand je me suis invitée en politique municipale en 2009, c'était dans un premier temps parce que j'étais intimement convaincue qu'il fallait redonner tout son sens au vocable citoyen. Le contribuable, celui qui paye pour des services, avait pris toute la place dans l'espace public. Les élus, à tous les niveaux, parlaient beaucoup de contribuables et peu de citoyens. Les citoyens ne sont pas tous des contribuables et les contribuables ne sont pas tous des citoyens. Le citoyen n'est pas une notion désincarnée des, des entités qui sont élues pour gouverner, que ce soit au niveau national, provincial, régional ou municipal. Le citoyen doit être au cœur de toutes les décisions et il ne peut se faire de développement durable sans le, qui est à l'encontre des intérêts du citoyen. Mais de son côté, le citoyen doit jouer un rôle et un rôle actif. Pour ce faire, on doit organiser des actions en ce sens. Et le plan de match a été concocté suite à une importante consultation publique chez nous. Donc, tout notre plan d'action pour la municipalité pour les 15 prochaines années est basé sur une grande consultation publique qui a eu lieu en septembre 2010, où les citoyens ont été invités à rêver leur ville, à soumettre des mémoires, des propositions. On en a débattu pendant une journée. On a tiré un plan d'action de, ce, de, ce, de cette grande journée de, euh, citoyenne et on a appelé ça Châteauguay 2020. Et... À travers ça, évidemment, il faut suivre, il faut inviter les citoyens à continuer dans la même euh, veine et la même lignée. 
Alors, on les entretient à chaque euh, deux mois. On a des rendez-vous citoyens. On a des conférenciers qui viennent leur parler de ce qu'est le développement économique, comment on voit la nouvelle urban, le nouvel urbanisme, les changements climatiques et comment s'y adapter, ce qu'une qu ville doit faire pour faire face aux, euh, aux défis qui vont se présenter à elle dans le futur. Et donc, on, on tient ces rencontres et avec tout ça, évidemment, on a mis en place les grands chantiers. Donc, parmi nos citoyens qui sont le plus intéressés à s'impliquer dans la municipalité, on a formé une dizaine de comités qui traitent d'aménagement du développement, de l'environnement, de la vie citoyenne, donc les loisirs, la culture, euh, la vie communautaire, les... L'administration intègre, éthique euh, également euh, le développement économique et ces citoyens se rencontrent plusieurs fois par année pour proposer des choses qui seront ensuite adoptées par le conseil municipal. Alors, c'est ainsi que nous avons rêvé notre ville. Et comme je le disais d'entrée de jeu, il est donc primordial, si nous souhaitons pouvoir réaliser cette communauté dynamique, prospère, compatissante, attractive, où nous sommes fiers et heureux de vivre, il est primordial donc que les choses changent que les municipalités soient véritablement reconnues comme des gouvernements de proximité, exerçant les compétences qui sont les leurs de façon autonome, en concordance avec les autres paliers gouvernementaux. C'est ce à quoi travaille l'Union des municipalités du Québec et qu'elle expose dans son livre blanc. Merci. Is this on yet? Are they on? You can hear me? Testing? Oh, yes. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. And so now we're going to go to an exchange amongst the panel. So if you have any questions, write them down if you have a short-term memory in, uh, issue. Um, otherwise, hold on. At uh, 5 to 3, because the break is at 3.15, at 5 to 3, I'm going to go to the audience so that you will have an opportunity to ask questions directly. And I've been told to encourage the students to ask the questions. Okay, so, and please feel free to answer in English or in French. And if anyone doesn't understand one of the two official languages, just put your hand up and... I can do the translation uh, off the cuff. I have a question, which probably a lot of you have. It's been referred to by every single mayor sitting here. And that is, what can you learn if you're a mayor of a large city from a small city? And given that we have two mayors of fairly large cities, Mayor Crombie and Mayor Savage, I'm going to ask you each very briefly, what can you learn from Yellowknife, from Stratford, and from Chateaugate? Bonnie, go first. Certainly, so thank you, Marlene. I think that you have to um, always remember your roots, preserve your culture, your tradition, and your heritage. Mississauga, of course, uh, as you know, 750,000 people, sixth largest in Canada, but we were an amalgamation of small towns and villages, Streetsville, Malton, Port Credit. So it's important to maintain your identity. But we can also learn from the best practices around the world, especially around Canada, some of the best ideas um, I used in my campaign came from other cities. They came from Calgary, and, and now I'm looking to Stratford and to Yellowknife at some of their best practices, and we can all, and, uh, and also Halifax, uh, yeah, my friend here who's got all the input <laughs> on uh, there. Yeah, no, 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 on the you know, democratic reform. I think there's uh, best practices we can learn from everyone, and that our challenges are similar. And uh, I think the number one challenge is, is always going to be how do we find that dedicated, sustainable funding so that we can continue to grow and continue to be the engine of change and the engine of the economy. Thank you, Bonnie. Mike. Well, there's two groups I belong to that I get a kick out of. One is the Big City Mayor's Caucus, where Halifax would be one of the smaller cities. Um, but the other is a group called the Atlantic Mayor's Congress, where I'm in uh, a meeting with other cities from Atlantic Canada, uh, some of whom are very, very small communities. In fact, last year at one of our meetings, 
we do a little round table, one of the highlights, and somebody had three houses built in their community that year, which was going to increase their tax rate. So you realize that in some cases, in some cases, the, the issues are the same. They're a matter of scale. We all have the same challenges when it comes to things like infrastructure, wastewater, roads, snow clearing, and all those kinds of things. And then there's other issues that, that are more peculiar to, to, to larger cities. I, I don't talk a lot of transit with communities that don't have transit. Affordable housing is a big issue in Halifax, as it is in some other communities. It's not as much with, uh, with others. But we've got some communities in Atlantic Canada that have done some amazing things, for example, on how to deal with extreme weather change uh, for coastal communities flooding and things like that, and some of the smaller communities have led uh, on that very much. So, you know, it really, we're all born and we all grow up somewhere. We, we weren't put in a big city because we were smarter. We weren't put in a little city or a town because we were smarter. Uh, there's smart people all over the place and there's good ideas and we all have to react uh, in some way to the major challenges that we all face. So, uh, in, some way, in some ways, the size doesn't really matter. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Does that sound okay? From the laughter here, if from the laughter in the room, it sounds like you may have some people who don't agree with you. I hope. Okay. Each one of you has mentioned the issue that the current fiscal and constitutional arrangements are basically breaks on your city's uh, means an opportunity to actually respond effectively to the needs of your community. Alors, j'aimerais commencer avec vous, uh, uh, Nathalie. Vous avez mentionné que vous avez eu un sommet 2020, et il y a plusieurs choses qui a sorti uh, suite à la consultation publique. Et une des choses dans votre PowerPoint était la question des arrangements fiscaux et constitutionnels qui sont vraiment des freins. Uh, alors, j'aimerais que vous expliquez uh, brièvement quels changements spécifiques ou les trois premiers qui devraient, devront être faits pour permettre à votre communauté et aux autres communautés de vraiment pouvoir répondre effectivement uh, aux besoins de leur population. En fait, ce qu'il faut comprendre, c'est que ça ralentit considérablement la machine. Et quand on parle, par exemple, de développement économique, quand les compagnies cherchent euh, à s'installer, euh, et notamment, nous, on a maintenant le, le taureau de 30 là, qui, euh, qui longe, euh, et c'est un nouvel outil, on a attendu après pendant 50 ans. Et, et donc, on voudrait pouvoir tirer avantage de, de, de cette autoroute-là. Et simplement avoir à demander la permission pour un, un terrain, euh, le ministère de l'Environnement. Après ça, le ministère des Transports. Après ça, le ministère des Affaires municipales. Après ça, on, on doit aller à la MRC. Après ça, on doit voir avec le plan métropolitain d'aménagement et de développement de la communauté métropolitaine de Montréal. Ensuite, ça nous revient avec, une fois que tout le monde est passé là-dessus, ça nous revient. Et là, on nous dit, il oh, faudrait changer la virgule, elle n'est pas mal placée, puis euh, revenez-nous. Alors, on recommence le même chemin. Et là, on arrive finalement, la compagnie est allée s'installer à Cornwall. Euh, et, et donc, tout passe comme ça sur notre nez parce qu'on n'est pas assez rapide à se positionner parce que la bureaucratie est beaucoup trop lourde et les ministères, les gouvernements, tous les paliers travaillent pas de façon dans des vases communicants. Ils travaillent en silo et à ce moment-là, on n'arrive pas à, à, à trouver notre chemin jusqu'à ce qu'on ait quelque chose qui se réalise sur notre terrain. Et en plus, il faut qu'on demande la permission pour emprunter, pour faire nos rues. Quand ils nous donnent des subventions, ils nous disent pourquoi il faut qu'on dépense l'argent. Parce que si moi, j'ai des besoins autres que de mettre de l'asphalte dans une rue ou changer un tuyau d'aqueduc, que j'aimerais mettre ça sur, pour revitaliser les berges de la, de la rivière, j'ai pas le droit à la subvention. Donc, on doit faire exactement ce qu'ils veulent, quand ils veulent, dans l'ordre qu'ils veulent. Et il faut qu'ils il faut qu'on soit gentil en plus pour qu'ils nous donnent la subvention. Et donc, euh, on, on, on ne finit pas. Et ce qui est triste, parce qu'on l'a dit, tous, tous et chacun, on l'a dit, c'est dans les villes que les choses se réalisent. C'est Les moteurs économiques sont dans les villes. La plus grande richesse du, du pays, c'est les citoyens. Ils sont, ils sont dans les villes. C'est notre territoire. Et on n'est même pas capable de se servir de ça pour avoir un levier qui a de l'allure pour notre qualité de vie à tous les niveaux. Merci, Nathalie. I'll, if, would you like me just to give you a little translation so that will allow you to um, respond? And I, I'm taking eight minutes for it. 
at the suggestion at the suggestion of my colleague here, former colleague Mike. Basically, what Mayor uh, Simon Nathalie just said is that one of the major problems, because of, because of the the existing fiscal legislative and constitutional arrangements that her city has to operate under, as, do every, as does every other city here, is, is that it takes so much time because there are so many different agencies and ministries that they have to deal with in order to get permission. So she, she was giving an example. A company wants to come in and install itself. It's going to uh, contribute to the economic development, provide jobs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because of the nature of the building, the uh, company, they have to go to the Minister of Environment, for instance. Then they have to go possibly to the Minister of Transport. Then they have to go to um, an agency that's responsible for regional economic development. Then they have to go here. Then they have to go there. By the time they get the approval, the company's already. Said, gone and gone somewhere else where the uh, barriers are not as strong. So you have a real barrier that exists for cities to be able to mass be masters of their own fate and that of it, their citizens because of our current constitutional and fiscal arrangement. She said they also have to get permission to borrow money. So if they have infrastructure projects that they want to do and they need to borrow money, they have to go hat in hand to the provincial government, et cetera, et cetera, in order to get permission. Mark, when you did your presentation, you specifically mentioned some of the constitutional issues that you have. One, native lands on which there are claims. Secondly, the Federal Electoral Boundary Commission, which you said made decisions that had no sense whatsoever given the, the positioning and the importance of Yellowknife to all of the Northwest Territories. Can you expand a little bit on that and possibly comment to whether or not you also, when I say you, I mean Yellowknife, also has the same issues of too many layers in order to be able to actually kick off a project. And then I'm going to come to you, Don, because you've, your city seems to have been able to do a heck of a lot of great things, and it'd be nice to know how you managed to do it with all of these layers. Go ahead, Mark. Thanks. And it's uh, just to clarify one thing, when I was speaking about electoral boundaries, that was the, uh, the Territorial Damn. Electoral Damn. Boundaries Commission. The, uh, the Federal Electoral Boundaries Commission, they can actually impose their decisions on, on the federal riding system. In our system, it's ultimately up to the legislature to approve it, which is where the problem is, because they have an entrenched interest in maintaining the status quo, which is why we end up with the status quo, which is why our only recourse is to the courts. Um, on, on the other issues, uh, certainly, you know, one of the big issues that we face with both land claims and, and some of the contaminated site issues that I mentioned before, we're never at the table. We're never invited to be at the table. Um, we have, you know, we're, we're charged with representing the interests of 20,000 citizens in our city, uh, but the federal and territorial governments, there is, there is still that uh, somewhat patriarchal attitude that, you know, this is the municipal government down here. We are the senior levels of government. And I consciously have stopped using the word the words levels of government. I, I refer to them as orders of government because in my mind anyway, we're all, we're all equal. Um, and we, we're not at that table. Uh, in terms of those contaminated sites I mentioned, again, we had to use a, a kind of a legislative maneuver to trigger an environmental assessment of one of the remediation plans for one of those mine sites, just so that we would have the opportunity to intervene in that process and express the interests, the best interests of our, of our citizens. In terms of the layers that we have to go through, I'm, I'm, I'm astounded at what some parts of the country have to go through. Uh, we have, a, have a, I would say, a greater degree of autonomy as a municipal government in the Northwest Territories than most do. I'm still trying to wrap my head around the Ontario Municipal Board. That seems like a, a very interesting construct. And certainly the experience of Chateauguay with, with all that they have to go through is, is uh, it's, it's a challenge. We are able to, for the most part, move things ahead. And that's one of the benefits of living in a smaller jurisdiction, quite frankly, uh, whether it's the city of Yellowknife or, or the Northwest Territories. While it's a vast geographic region, uh, really population-wise and, and relationship-wise, it is a small place. It's nothing for me to go and knock on the Premier or the Minister 
your finances door with the territorial government and say, look, we need to talk about an issue. Um, but one of the other issues from a, from the national perspective, and I think it was it was Mike that spoke to you know having strong communities across the country leading to a strong country, is that we've got a complete hodgepodge of situations from province to province and territory to territory where there is no uniformity in in what applies to each of us. Uh, some places, some municipalities have different powers, uh, some have different responsibilities, and on top of all that we tend to get regulations downloaded to us that impose further costs on us without the fiscal or legislative tools to deal with those. Uh, the most recent example for us was the territorial government adopted drinking water regulations that were uh, established by the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment. Well, for the city of Yellowknife, that meant a requirement to build a new $30 million water treatment plant. There was no funding that came along with that decision to impose those regulations on us, uh, but it came. And down the road, we're looking at uh, wastewater regulations that will be imposed on municipalities across Canada. Uh, so, you know, those are some of the issues that we need, need to deal with, and I think it's necessary to have a, a national conversation uh, on, on the state of cities and what cities need and begin to pull in all those different orders of government to have that conversation. Thank you. Dan, I've been mistakenly calling Dan Don. So, no, no, and he said, it's all right as long as you don't kick me out of here. I confess, I am lousy, absolutely not lousy with names. Um, so, I, one, I apologize. And um, Dan, how has Stratford managed to meet some of the challenges, if not all, but some of the challenges that are facing a lot of mid-sized, smaller cities um, when we hear about all of these different levels um, of government that can be a break? Well, I think part of the challenge for us is that we've, uh, we've had challenges. Instead of waiting for the senior levels of government or, or partners that we have in government, sorry, Mark, I don't want to upset you on that, but one of the challenges, instead of waiting for them to act, we've just decided we're going to do what's in the best interest of our community and go forward. I'll give you an example. Between 2004 and 2014, the city of Stratford did 250 million dollars, a quarter of a billion dollars of infrastructure spending in our community. We received 66 million of it from senior levels of government. We raised over, well, let's say about 85 million of it through taxation, our capital budget, and we put the other 60 some million dollars in debt. Because we couldn't wait for this archaic idea that one third, one third, one third will come forward, because we suffer from not having a member of the government in the provincial legislature, which is the first strike, an ineffective member of the governing party at the senior level, so you don't get it. And unless you play those games, it doesn't work. So we just, we just decided we're going to do it. Our citizens deserve to have roads that are, are paved, sewers, both sanitary and storm, that are reliable, water that is safe and drinkable, arenas and community centers that are usable. The University of Waterloo Stratford campus was a $20 million project and we needed to come up with $10 million for operating endowment. The federal government told us very clearly we don't do funding for education, which is garbage because the same year through the Western Diversification Fund in Alberta, which is federally funded, they gave $20 million to the University of Alberta, but they wouldn't give $10 million to the city of Stratford towards our project. We went out, ponied up a city of 32 million, not a country of 35 million, a city of 32,000, went out and put $10 million up, bought the land for 5 million, convinced the province it was a good investment at 10 million, and got $10 million from the Open Text Corporation of Waterloo, Ontario, and Tom Jenkins, the CEO, because they believed in a vision. The system's broke. There's over 2,000 communities in this country, and you shouldn't expect 2,000 of them to have to adapt and find new ways to do things each and every day because the rules don't work. There's 58, or over 50% of the infrastructure in this country is owned by municipalities and we have less than 10% of the funding to administer it because we don't grow with the economy. And as they see increases in revenue like they have with the oil patch, they've gone and done what's important to them. Reduce taxes, talk about law and order, and things that don't matter to the quality of life in communities. And what happens is they pass the expenses on to us. And I'm the one that has to face people and say, taxes are going up 2% this year or 3%. And I can tell them that their home's worth more, but that means nothing to people. When the federal government collects money, more money from people, at least they have something to show for it because more went in their pocket every year. It's a sad state of affairs. And I think FCM has done a good job. Paul Martin, 
through the green funds, I will say in the gas tax money, at least we have predictable amounts of funding we can expect every year, but that doesn't solve the problem. That's the first step in a 100-mile journey. Wow, thank you. Before I go to the next question, Bonnie, would you like yes. to yes, would. comment? Thank you. Please, go ahead. So, and I'm sure Mike would as well, but I think Dan painted an excellent picture of you. It's clearly our biggest challenge, our biggest constraint is our ability to raise revenue. I mean, how much can we realistically increase your property taxes each year? When you look at the city's abilities to raise money, you have property taxes, you have user fees and development charges for the most part. How else can we do it? And, and Dan, as Dan said, cities collect 11 cents on the total tax dollar, yet we own 66% of the infrastructure. Think about that. 11 cents on 66%. The feds, it's inverted. Feds collect 55 cents on the tax dollar and own 3%, 3% of the infrastructure. And the province is about a third. They collect a third and they own a third. So you can see how we're hamstrung. Um, t we all have envy probably of the Toronto Act because they have other fundraising abilities. They have the ability to impose the land transfer tax and the vehicle registration tax. But there is that culture that cities, municipalities, provinces don't want to raise taxes, right? We want the other order of government to raise those taxes. So, of course, they haven't used those abilities. They've been cutting them back each year, hamstringing their ability to raise money, and they have a deficit of $86 million in Toronto this year. As you know, um, Mayor Tory has gone cap in hand to the province and the federal government for his deficit. Um, we, and then, you know, we're told to look at 3P investments. I mean, how do I build your capital infrastructure um, based on my ability to raise revenue. My, uh, we talked about uh, my light rail transit, 1.6 billion. How do I come up with $530 million in the back of property taxes? It's almost impossible. That's up to the federal and provincial government. They need to have a greater awareness that they need to continue to invest in our cities. But when I look at some of our other challenges, just briefly, because I'm sure Mike like to get in here too, our ability to borrow money, I'm single tier. Our upper tier government, the region of Peel, has to float our debentures. Secondly, thirdly, is the power of the conservation authorities. I don't know if anyone's tried to get a building permit, you have to go through hoops to get approvals from the conservation authorities. They've been a big challenge. And then, of course, we've mentioned the municipal boards. The Ontario Municipal Board has the power to supersede our planning decisions at council. Think about that. We make decisions what we think is best for our communities, developments that we think is right for our communities, and developers have the ability to go to an appeals tribunal and, and, and strike those decisions down. They have the ability to supersede our decisions. So that is very, very frustrating. Um, so I think those are our biggest constraint, but obviously the one to raise revenue is foremost. Mike? Yeah, if I can. So the financial stuff, I, I agree with my colleagues. Uh, in Halifax, for example, uh, the CCME guidelines on uh, water and uh, wastewater imposed by the feds, which was mentioned, is going to mean $600 million cost to the city of Halifax. We don't get any money uh, for that from the feds. Understand the reason they're doing it, uh, but it's easy to say you've got to follow these regulations. It's going to cost you $600 million. But aside from the money, to the point that was made earlier, the, the, the sort of the legislative ha uh, handcuffs that are put on municipalities, the city of Halifax has virtually no campaign finance regulations municipally. The only rule is that you have to disclose your donors three months after the election. There's no limit on what you can spend. There's no limit on who you can raise money from. There's no limit on how much they can give you. I brought forward to our council in the fall uh, a plan that we do campaign finance reform. You look at what's happening federally and provincially, it's pretty stringent. Uh, so our council passed that after a lot of discussion. But it now sits in a list of legislative amendments that we're asking for from the province. Something as simple as that. Permanent residents voting past our council. The province has to approve it. And the problem that we have in Nova Scotia is Halifax is a city of 415,000. The next biggest city is maybe 100,000. And after that, your cities of 10,000 municipalities or smaller. So the, the, the challenges that face us are, are not the same as them. So what we're saying to the province is, I get it. Okay, so when Halifax became a city amalgamated in 1997, the debt of the province of Nova Scotia was about $7 billion. Today it's $15 billion. The debt of the municipality back then was $350 million. It's now $220 million. So our finances are better than the province's. I understand that stuff. What we're saying is take off the handcuffs. Give us the responsibility to do what we need to do as a city. We will take the political liability. We have to go to the polls too, you know. We've got to get elected and re-elected. Just let us lead. Let us be part of it in a non-arrogant way. 
We'll work with you, and we will, uh, we're not just looking for, for that, we'll work with you on things the city hasn't done before. We're doing stuff on housing, on immigration, on health. We're doing all those things, but you've got to take off the handcuffs and let this city lead the charge in Nova Scotia, and it will pay off for the province. I guarantee you. Thank you. Given... Go ahead and applaud. They all deserve it. Given what each one of you have said, about how you've been handcuffed, how your city, your municipality is handcuffed by the different orders of government and different agencies that, that uh, answer to one or another order of government that actually limit your ability to meet the needs of your citizens, your residents. If the Prime Minister walked in here right now, what would you tell him about what your city needs from the federal government that you believe would not only be good for your city, but would be good for all or the majority of cities across Canada. Nathalie. Um, I guess that, um, and I don't know for other provinces, but uh, at Châtelier, au Québec, uh, la loi sur l'aménagement et l'urbanisme, c'est ce qui régit les villes, le, le, notre plein pouvoir de d'aménager nos villes et de les développer euh, relève de cette loi-là. Et malheureusement, les lois, des, je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, l'industrie Canada, euh, les aéroports, les trains, les tours de télécommunication sont des, des, des champs de compétences qui n'ont de, de, de permission à demander à personne pour passer dans nos villes, faisant fi de nos plans d'urbanisme, des efforts qu'on met à bien planifier notre développement pour la qualité de vie de nos citoyens. Et je pense qu'on a un ménage à faire dans les compétences de chacun des niveaux. Et que le fédéral garde son champ de compétences, que le provincial garde son champ de compétences et qu'il nous donne à nous les compétences qui nous reviennent, parce qu'on est les premiers artisans de la qualité de vie des citoyens. Would you like to see, in terms of federal agencies, that you say have a right to come in under the law and do whatever they want within your municipality to have to that they be uh, obliged of course to actually I mean we're going Shadagi is going against Rogers communication to Supreme Court there you in, go. in October because we offered them to put their antenna in another place which was a good place for them as the the, the place they primarily uh, choose to put their antenna. And we have to fight against them to Supreme Court. I mean, we're 50,000 people trying to just have a, a surrounded area, like a, quite yes. a life quality, without in being uh, invaded by uh, all those antennas and, and put them somewhere apart in the municipality. N not only say, not in my backyard, you just say, can you put your antenna there? It will be... Uh, Easier for us to live with? No. Good point. Dan, what would you like to tell? If it's the Prime Minister of Canada, then it's the Prime Minister. But I think I just saw a Premier uh, Wynne walk in, too. <laughs> what would you like to tell those two? Well, in honor of David Johnson and Alex is here, I'd say he made a very good choice for Governor General. Uh, I tell the Prime Minister and Madame Wynne that uh, we need predictable funding, uh, first at the federal level. Uh, we should be able to apply for grants through different federal programs that are transparent in what is required of municipalities and expect that they're processed in an equitable and fair manner, not based on geography or partisan politics. Uh, and I think that needs a, a full reform. I think they need to look at what they pass with regards to regulations and what, how they fund it down to municipalities. If Madame Wynne was here, I would speak to the Premier about the fact that there are different opportunities in the province of Ontario for municipalities to move forward. If they would allow us uh, the decision-making powers, uh, Bonnie Land on one, Mark mentioned it, the Ontario Municipal Board should not be able to overturn our decisions. Two, it's great they want to give small cities like Stratford gas tax money, but to tell us it has to go to public transit, we have 15 buses. We have the nicest 15 buses you're ever going to meet. <laughs> we don't wear them out. I don't need to buy them every three years. I need to take that money, though, and I should be able to put it 
whether it's towards a mental health center in our community, an expansion of health, uh, health unit services, uh, better education pieces with regards to retraining and skills development, I should be able to do that. I don't need the parochial parent telling me how to run my municipality. And frankly, it doesn't matter whether it's Premier Wynne or whether it was Premier Harris or McGinty or in this province, uh, any number, you know, any number of them, it happens everywhere. And I would just tell them that they need to trust us. And Mike's touched on, I go before the electorate, I have a little bit better success than some of them. Maybe they should listen to me a little bit. I could, I could help them. <laughs> Mike has something to say and yeah, then Bonnie. Okay. So uh, the Prime Minister never listened to me much when I was in the House of Commons. I doubt he'd listen to what I had to say. But I would say this to anybody who wants to know why, why cities need more power. It's pay attention. What's happening? Forty years ago, the popular mayor of Toronto, David Crombie, resigned as mayor to become a cabinet minister federally. Twenty years ago, the popular mayor of Toronto, Art Eggleton, resigned to become a cabinet minister. Last year, a member of parliament, Olivia Chow, resigned from the House of Commons to run for mayor of Toronto, where she lost to the former provincial leader of the Conservative Party. I'm told that the mayor of Montreal used to be a federal mm -hmm. politician. My old colleague, Denis Coder, the mayor of Vancouver used to be a provincial politician. The mayor of Ottawa used to be a cabinet minister in Ontario. The mayor of Mississauga is over here. The mayor of Brampton was resigned from the cabinet to run for municipal politics. In Nova Scotia, I used to be federal. The mayor of Sydney, the second biggest municipality, used to be provincial. You can look all across the country, where for years the municipal politics was the farm system to provincial and federal politics, today it's reversed. The leadership in the world and ideas is coming from Boris Johnson, it's coming from Bloomberg, it's coming from Rahm Emanuel, it's coming from all the, this is where the energy is, it's happening. So people recognize it because that's the, the farm system's turned around. The energy is in cities. and. You can either get on the bus or you can be run over by the bus. And we will have to be responsible. We have to be responsible leaders. But there has to be a recognition that this is where the power has shifted and there's a reason for it. And that's because cities matter more than ever. Thank you. Bonnie. Thank you. And then Mark. Yeah, just and quickly. then we're going to go to uh, the open questions. Yeah. Bonnie. And we don't want to be thrown under the bus, Mike. So the big city mayors represent two-thirds of the population over half the ridings. The majority of our population lives in large urban areas. I don't mean to be cynical, but if you've looked at the political representation of, of our urban areas, they tend to be held by opposition members. So that's number one. I don't think the government cares as much because it's not their political base. They need to start caring. They need to look at things like national strategy when it comes to affordable housing, when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to transit and transportation. We need these decisions to be made at the top. We need them to understand that they are in the pothole business because we can't all afford to be. And they need to stop making ad hoc decisions. We need that sustainable, dedicated funding so we can make our own decisions. Let me just give you one example. So Toronto is building well. There's some, one day it's a subway and some days it's a light rail transit and then they overturn it and they start all over again. And they've been looking cap in hand for funding for their subway or their light rail transit. They've gone to the provincial government who seems to be willing and a willing investor into public transit. But they weren't willing to invest in a subway after to overturn the decision of the light rail transit. So what did Rob Ford do? He went fishing with Prime Minister Harper and came back with $660 million for a subway. This is a blatantly ad hoc political approach to, to funding. It is wrong. It is wrong. There is no business case for a three-stop subway in, in Scarborough. I'm very sorry. We have a very strong business case for our light rail transit because light rail costs a fraction of what a subway does. I don't know if you understand the, business, the economics of light rail on top of the ground. If you raise it to become a monorail, it's four times the cost. If you bury it and tunnel it, create a subway, it's seven times the cost. So we live in Mississauga. We're very practical about these things. We want a light rail transit system. We already, 29,000 people a day already ride buses along that subway. Do you know what the business case in Scarborough is? It, it's almost non-existent. So we're just saying we want our fair share share of the funding and we don't want these very political ad hoc approach to funding. Funding has to come from a national strategy and it has to be dedicated and it has to be sustainable. We have to be able to rely on it so we can make planning decisions. They need to start caring about cities where the majority of the population lives, which create jobs and are the economic engines. That's it. Great. Wow. Mark. Well, at the risk of becoming, as Mike put it, a chronic complainer of confederation. I like oh, that. Go way, ahead. I heard that but, 
That's uh, Canadian. <laughs> I will, I will uh, repeat to a degree what some of my colleagues have said. Certainly to the Prime Minister, I would say share your revenues and not share as in an application-based application program where, uh, you know, something was announced two years ago called the Build Canada Fund that was meant to fund infrastructure in this country. Uh, I believe the $600 million for the subway is, is about the only money that anybody so far has seen from that Build Canada Fund. But a lot of these things are smoke and mirrors. The Build Canada Fund is $14 billion over 10 years, uh, but it's broken down so you're looking at $1.4 billion per year, which when we look at the magnitude of infrastructure issues in this country is nothing. It's also broken down between projects of national significance, projects of regional significance, and projects of local significance. So when you drill down even further, there's even less money for that 50 to 60 percent of the infrastructure that community governments own. The gas tax is a fantastic example brought in by, by Paul Martin and made permanent by, by the current federal government and also indexed now. So it's a predictable, stable source of funding that municipal governments can count on. There was a golden opportunity when the current federal government was talking about the GST and reductions to take a portion of that and devote it to municipalities and allow it to grow over time with the economy. That wasn't done. It was, it was just cut. So that opportunity for now has been lost. But I know this is something FCM has talked about in the past, and it's a conversation that, that needs to happen in the, in the future as well. You know, we, uh, the national conversation and the provincial territorial conversation is often, you can't bring up taxes, you can't talk about raising taxes. That memo hasn't seemed to make it to the municipal sector yet, because we do, we do raise taxes. Uh, you know, most municipalities raise taxes almost every year. And when you have a last name that's pronounced hike, and you talk about taxes going up a lot, it makes for some way too easy headlines in our local newspaper. But the reason that I think, you know, many were savage, yes. Savage tax hikes, I like that. But, but, but the reason many municipal politicians who, you know, openly talk about taxes are reelected, I think, is because people see the tangible results of where their tax dollars are going. It's the streets and the roads that they use every day, uh, the sidewalks that they use to walk their kids to school, the recreational facilities that they go to, uh, the school taxes that go to the schools where their kids are at. So there's more acceptance there. Uh, so you know, I think we need to get back to a conversation about sharing revenues and, and pegging it at a certain percentage as opposed to these application-based programs which A, are not a lot of money to begin with, and B, are subject to uh, you know, all sorts of funny business in terms of how they, the dollars actually get doled out. To our premier, I would say we need a le different legislative framework. There's a legitimate, uh, you know, point to be made about the Canadian Constitution and how municipalities are creatures of provincial governments. Uh, but on that level and in that relationship between provincial, territorial and municipal governments, we need to have a real conversation about the needs of the, those governments and, and as, again, as Mike said, you know, let municipalities take the handcuffs off. Uh, the City of Toronto Act is certainly something that, while Toronto and Yellowknife have many differences, uh, in terms of our context within the provinces and the territories that we operate, we're somewhat similar. And we feel strongly that a special piece of legislation is needed to govern the City of Yellowknife because we do have the, the capacity and the ability to represent our citizens in a fair, open and accountable manner and that should be recognized legislatively. Thank you. Thank you. And now, we've gone a little bit over the uh, agenda, the amount of time, you know, schedule for everything. So instead of having um, 20 minutes for the question period from the audience, we have 15 minutes. Exactly. So I open it up. I'm going to ask you to, one, identify yourself and then ask a brief question. If you go on too long, I'm cutting you off at the knees. <laughs> and the uh, mayors here, I don't want each mayor to respond to one question, okay? Um, whoever gets their hand up first gets to answer the question, okay? So, it's open, go ahead. I'm not a mayor. Well, to present somebody's like 
c'est compliqué. Dans une première fois, vous devez convaincre la personne de présenter ou de se présenter, ce qui n'est pas tout le monde qui veut rentrer dans la like, politique. Et then it, the person has to be elected. So uh, it's like two level of difficulty uh, to be a representative. But uh, we do have a lot of, um, and I'm, uh, by the way, the president of uh, Femme et Gouvernance de l'Union des Municipalités du Québec. So I'm doing a lot of things to promote uh, uh, politics uh, through women. And, Uh, la difficulté, c'est de rejoindre, and the young people too. We used to have uh, an Asian girl on our uh, late uh, administration, Esther, which is a young uh, lawyer, and, and, and she had to quit because she, uh, she, she, instead of being a counselor, she started to be a mother. But uh, it, it's quite hard. But, and then also to just understand the rule and, and you know the new ways of like the new arrivals are like are already learning to be citizens of their, their new countries and cities and then to just bring them to uh, step uh, uh, higher then it's it's hard thank you very quickly Bonnie, just very quickly like I just to want to say next. that we know that female representation is about 25% across the country but I think you're talking about more than that and I want to say that in Mississauga a number of people have stepped forward from diverse communities for nominations we have nominated many diverse candidates which is excellent many candidates municipally have stepped forward people who are from, you know Pakistani Muslim backgrounds Sikhs etc have all stepped forward now we didn't have the benefit of electing one this time in Mississauga but I think it's coming very very close, very close. So as a result, I created something called Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee, and we're just about to do the interviews to appoint it. I want to be sure they have a voice on council since no one has been elected, so I want to be sure their voices are heard and their needs and their issues are met. Thank you, that's excellent. La prochaine. Uh, je m'appelle Michel Faure. Uh, I am a resident of uh, the TMR, town of Montreal. Who, which is uh, one of the very rare garden cities in Canada and the only one in Quebec. I would quote a French philosopher and politician, Simone Veil. She said, Sans dialogue, il n'y a pas de débat, pas d'échange d'idées, donc pas de démocratie. Without dialogue, there's no debate, no exchange of ideas, therefore no democracy. We have a mayor. <coughs> in TMR, who for three years has held secretive talks with lobbyists. And we learned about two weeks ago that they're about to build a giant mega mall in TMR. Do you feel that this is democratic? Thank you. I'm going to give that to the mayors outside of Quebec, okay? <laughs> I don't want a uh, Quebec mayor um, to be in a, the possibly difficult situation of cr criticizing publicly or not um, a colleague. So I will go to, he doesn't want it, Mark? Yeah, I, he's all the way up in yellow I'm the night. furthest one away. Merwa so will have a hard one. time getting up there. Go ahead. Well, I can't speak to the specifics of, of this situation, but I would say that My experience, both as a councillor for three terms and now as mayor for the last two, is that municipal and community governments are by far the most responsive of any order of government. Um, for better or worse, sometimes I've seen it where an issue comes before a council, and you know those people who are engaged in the community will come out en force at that meeting. Uh, they will make phone calls, they will send emails, they will write letters, and I've seen councils turn. Now, sometimes tough decisions are the right decisions, and they may not make everybody happy, and you can end up with a bad result because a council might cave to that. Uh, but most of the time, you know, as far as engage, engaging citizens go, I would say municipal government is at the, the, top of the top of the pile. The second point I would make, and this is one of the interesting things about some of the legislative constraints we're under, We can't hold private meetings except for very, very specific reasons. Um, you know, in our circumstances, there are a, just a tiny handful of, of issues that can be discussed privately by mayor and council. Everything else, by law, is required to be out in the open and done publicly. Thank you. No, uh, thank you. Uh, Prashen, next, please. 
Name uh, and short question. Yes, uh, hello, my name is Jamie Klinger, uh, founder of joatu.org. Um, I wanted to ask you your opinions on the Comer versus the Bank of Canada case. Uh, Comer is the Committee on Monetary and Economic Reform. And uh, basically this case is, is trying to reverse the Bank of Canada Act of 1977, I believe, um, which would allow the Bank of Canada to lend money to Canada for 0% interest for infrastructure. So right now we're paying an incredible amount on interest and so on because of that. Um, this would allow us to reverse that decision and it's, uh, it's, it's going Is, forward. Are any of the mayors here familiar with the uh, law case? No, so I'm sorry, no. you're not going to get an answer for okay, that one. I, I you just have? say I'm in, I'm in favor of 0% interest. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> for, for do you have a Can, question on yes, another issue very briefly? Um, I'd like to know uh, where you stand on alternative economic systems, uh, local sharing, um, trading and uh, barter systems, how you plan on supporting that uh, locally in your, uh, in your communities. Thank you. Okay. Would anyone care to respond to that? Yours? Okay, Natalie. But it's, it's quite difficult for, um, in Quebec, municipalities are not allowed to give subsidies. So uh, we just are able to facilitate the venue of uh, economical interest in, in, in the city. And by having proper zoning or uh, proper uh, price for the land and tax uh, in, in, uh, income taxes. Next, Thank no. Thank you. Next name and brief question. Hello, my name is Sunita Negam and I'm a, a doctoral candidate in cultural studies at McGill. Um, I think you've painted a clear portrait of uh, how the cities um, need more power. And the next question is, uh, well, what will you do with this power? Um, if I'm asked what, um, what is it that we need most urgently in our cities, it's cities that are actively working to narrow the gap between those that have and those that do not have. Uh, and my question is, what are some of the ways that your uh, municipal governments are working to narrow this gap? Excellent question. Okay, uh, Mike and then Dan. Sure, I think it's a very good, good question. You know, uh, there's a lot of issues where... You, where one of the biggest enemies of solutions in Canada is jurisdiction because no government will take on something that might be in somebody else's jurisdiction. What we need to do as governments is say not, not who has the jurisdiction but who has the problem. And in a lot of cases, the feds have the money, the province has the jurisdiction, but the cities have the problem. So housing, immigration, health, these are not things in Nova Scotia that, that cities have been involved in, but we've gotten involved in those things because it will make a lot of sense for us. We have an affordable housing uh, coalition with United Way and some other partners. We're working with what's called a local immigration uh, partnership. And on poverty and social exclusion, we're also working with a number of agencies to say, what does the city have? So. We're not going to give a lot of money on some things, but we have some vacant buildings that may be uh, able to be used in social enterprises that provide opportunities for people. So I think that whole issue is really, really important because, and also as we develop our downtowns, since those of us who've had sprawl, if you want people to live downtown, where are they going to live? They can't all live in million dollar condos. You need to have opportunities and spaces for them. And once you have, if you want families downtown, where are the kids going to go to school? Where are they going to have childcare? Where are the green spaces? Where are they going to shop? They can't shop in the little boutiques where you know, uh, a steak is $18. So all those different things, providing opportunities, because the downtown of our cities is the best opportunity for real coming together of people of all different incomes, looks, shapes, sizes, demographics, uh, and ages. Uh, and I think the cities can, can do that. Thank you. Before I uh, turn it over to Dan, I see that I believe there are four more people to ask questions. I'm cutting it off there because otherwise you're not going to get a break, so you're not going to be able to go to the bathroom or go for a quick smoke or whatever it is, make a, an important phone call. So I'm going to the... Um, very briefly, Dan, and then we'll go to the next of the three. I believe it's three or four? Four. And you're going to have to be really brief. Okay. Go ahead. In Stratford, we've gone and created what's called the local. And it's an opportunity for people to go there to either get skills development with regards to how to eat healthy, how to get resources with regards to education and training. Uh, how we try to do a continuum of people on social assistance where they can come in and have a needs assessment done, 
uh, try to get them the training they require and move them out of social assistance and into uh, the working world. And then taking people that are at the lower end of the retail spectrum and trying to get them trained up to take into manufacturing jobs. Currently there's about 250 to 300 manufacturing jobs in our community that are unfilled because of skills uh, not being there. So we've tried to create a continuum and a support network, giving people that uh, we understand that if they have a healthy uh, diet and a, a self-esteem level, uh, they're in a better position. With regards to social and public housing, we suffer. We have 1,100 uh, units, 500 50 public housing, 600 social housing units, uh, and we have a 200 person waiting list. So we've started to support uh, landlords uh, or people building units. Our whole city is a community improvement zone. So if it's a brownfield redevelopment, we phase the taxes in over 10 years, and we've tried to find ways to support development through that. Excellent. I'm going to ask the last four questioners to each one, one after another, identify yourself, ask your questions, and then the mayors will answer, uh, I'll make sure that each one of your questions is answered by at least one mayor, okay? And that way we'll keep back, we'll get back to the timetable. Go. Great, sounds good. Uh, my name is Michael, I'm from Chicago. Um, my question was, uh, what do you think the role of higher education institutions should be um, in urban areas in terms of workforce development, uh, providing opportunity, uh, and economic investment? Thanks Excellent so much. question. Next. Hi, my name is Laura Espiau. I work on the organization of the Global Social Economy Forum, GSEF 2016, which is going to be held in Montreal next year. It's an international event which will assemble uh, local governments and social economy around the subject of cities. So I would like to know which is the role that you see or, or accord to social economy in your municipalities. Excellent, next. Hello, uh, my name is John Faithful Hamer, and I would like to pay more income taxes. <laughs> right now I pay two, uh, one to Canada and one to Quebec. I would like to pay three. I would like my income taxes to be split in one-third, one-third, one-third. I would like one-third to go to Montreal or to the city that you live in, one-third to the municipal government, one-third to the provincial government, one-third to the federal government. How do we make that happen by 2020? Thank you. And final question. Hi, my name is Geneviève. I'm a graduate student at McGill in Religious Studies. And I'm really concerned about the place of a religious space in the public sphere in Canada, which is my study right now. And I'm wondering on a municipal, municipal level if you're interested or if you're concerned it's part of your duties to deal with the promotion of multicultural and diversified public religious space to create dialogue and to reinforce a sense of Canadian identity that is diversified and also to preserve the ancestral religious homes that we have that are now being converted in condos. So it's maybe not a, any of a concern on the municipal level, but I'm just asking whether it is. Excellent. So we've had a question on the role of higher education institutions in providing jobs, training, um, working with the municipalities towards better economic development, etc. We've had a question on the uh, income tax. How do you go get about getting a, an even split so that municipalities get their fair share? We've had a question on social economy. And finally, we've had a question on the diversity of uh, religion and the role that uh, cities can play with that. Bonnie, I'm going to ask I'm gonna, you to, uh, I'm to gonna respond to... I'm going to go real quick. To, Maybe we all could just yeah. real quick. So on religion, so we're certainly building more mosques, gurdwaras, and mandirs and temples than we are um, churches. The churches that exist today tend to be evangelical churches in, in industrial units in malls. So that's what's happening. I did fight to keep the Lord's Prayer. It was a... Con a tradition that people wanted and that was that worked out well for us on on the uh, job training uh, we did invest in post-secondary to 10 million dollars I mentioned that earlier we have a program called Advantage Mississauga we try where it's uh, where we try to match the the jobs with the training that's received in Mississauga we try to match that need 
with what the jobs are of the future. We want to be able to provide that training at the post-secondary that we have in our city. Income tax, I meant to mention that earlier. I think that's the way we need to go in the future. We need to make our federal provincial governments recognize they need to share income tax with us, not, and not just allow us to property tax. And I just want to make one comment on the man from the town of Mart Royal. What you need there, sir, is a code of conduct for your councillors and your mayor. You need an integrity commissioner. You need open budgetary process. Uh, you need to post the expenses online and perhaps you need a lobby registry so we can keep track of who's meeting with whom when. Those are some of the things that we do other than the lobby registry in Mississauga and has worked out very well for us. We do have an integrity commissioner so discussions like that can be challenged and taken right to the commissioner. Thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. Mark. Thanks. On the, on the question of higher, higher education, absolutely. Uh, particularly for small to mid-sized cities, uh, a university institution or some sort of higher educational institution can ab absolutely be foundational to the lo local economy and to the sustainability of that community. Uh, we currently have no, no, no universities in northern Canada as far as the three territories that go. Uh, we do have a college, it's called Aurora College in Yellowknife, but it has three campuses, one in Inuvik, one in Yellowknife, one in Fort Smith. Coming back to my earlier comments about some of the political challenges we face at the territorial level, we cannot get them to build a standalone campus in Yellowknife, and we will never have a university until we have that. So that's something we are actively engaged in, but as Dan mentioned in, in Stratford as well, it's, it's a key part of the local economy. Uh, on the income tax, absolutely, I agree with you 100%. And one thing to note about that is, uh, you know, in, in the global context, Canadian municipalities are far more hamstrung than municipalities in virtually any other part of the world. In the United States, um, you know, there are, are local governments that can raise sales taxes, income taxes, uh, they can set minimum wage, they have all sorts of financial and legislative tools that we don't have here. Uh, how we get there, that's a really good question. I wish I had more time to try to answer that, but um, on, on religious spaces, uh, certainly we, you know, all our, all our um, uh, institutional spaces for, for religious spaces are tax exempt. That's one thing that we do to, to facilitate that. Uh, we are a very multi-ethnic and, and diverse community and we, we do every, everything we can to, to celebrate that. Uh, certainly religious freedoms have been in the news in, in recent days. Uh, and that's something that we pride ourselves on is our, our tolerance and, and celebration of, of all those different uh, religions and ethnicities. Thank you. Dan. Well, I believe universities, business, and government needs to come together under the triple helix model. Businesses should be giving their problems to universities. Students should be st studying and working on relevant pieces uh, of industry that allow them to solve problems, own the proprietary IP that go with it, much like Waterloo does. Uh, the University of Waterloo does, and then allow that to uh, germinate into an incubation center or an accelerator center within the community to give students an opportunity to start their own business or to at least collaborate together on solutions uh, and prepare them for the work world. Uh, with regards to religious spaces, uh, much like us, we are much like Mark, we do not uh, charge property tax on uh, religious spaces within uh, the province of Ontario. Uh, we allow city facilities to be used by uh, religious groups rent it for uh, their own services, so some of the various religious groups use city facilities as a way to uh, incubate them within our community. We host an annual prayer breakfast by myself, which allows any uh, religious denomination to come forward, and it comes together in an effort to recognize community and uh, coming together with respect and uh, for each other. Uh, with regards to the social development uh, question, I can't remember what that was, Marlene. Um, social economy. Social economy. I, I got to be honest. Uh, I don't. I haven't done enough on it to understand uh, how we could move forward with it. But there are things like that that are going to evolve over time. That are, are collaborative efforts between the three levels of government. But it also requires us to not be bound by uh, the municipal act, which is almost in Ontario. Uh, updated about every century whether we need it or not. And lastly, the income tax. I like the fact that you want to pay income tax to all three levels uh, of government and I think that's great. The first thing we need probably would be a first minister's conference because they haven't met for about five years together and they'd need to get together and talk about it and then they'd have to sit down with FCM who's only told them about this for about ten years. So that's great. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, they're all good questions but I'm going to go on the first one, the education. Uh, so Halifax is, is a university town. We have six of them. We have all kinds of universities. We have a very strong community college. I've always felt that universities over the last decade or so have been looked at by governments as opportunities for rationalization as opposed to opportunities for leverage. So we started when I became mayor, the Halifax Higher Education Partnership. We meet on a regular basis with the universities, the community college, and the real focus is talent attraction and retention. Halifax needs people like a lot of cities. We have an advantage. We are a university and college town. 
we have a lot going for us. The problem is that there aren't the opportunities. So how do you create opportunities? One of the things that we did as a municipality is we started a program called Bridging the Gap, where we hire each year 18 students right out of university because the three to five year experience is a killer. People move away, they don't come back. Uh, that's one thing that we did. That came out of that uh, uh, partnership. The international students reception that you saw is very important. We're one of the best places to go to school. Now I see a lot of students here. I showed you the best library in the world, brand new, top 10 building in the world. I've talked about the universities. I want to tell you one last fact. I'll leave you with this, Marley. And according to Matador Magazine, write it down, you can Google it. According to Matador Magazine, Halifax was chosen as one of the top 20 places in the world to party before you die. That's a fact. So all those things together, education, smart people, job opportunities, party before you die, Halifax. Now that's audacity to come into Montreal, a university city, and make a pitch. You get schools here? <laughs> You're listening to this, Madame Fortier. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Nathalie. Et moi, je dirais que Châteauguay est la meilleure ville où vivre avant de mourir. Ah! Alors, euh, au niveau de l'éducation, la grande région de Montréal, ben, en fait, grâce à Montréal, on a une cité universitaire avec une des meilleures universités au monde. Euh, à proximité, donc on est choyé. Et par contre, il y a seulement 20% de la population qui a un diplôme universitaire. Et ça, c'est très peu si on veut euh, que la grande métropole soit compétitive face aux autres métropoles euh, nord-américaines notamment. Donc, il faut faire des efforts. À Châteauguay, on a un projet de bâtiment multifonctionnel. On veut déplacer des, euh, des services municipaux, les rendre plus centraux, plus... Euh, près des citoyens, et dans ce bâtiment-là, on a prévu des étages pour attirer euh, des cours universitaires et collégiaux, avoir de la formation continue avec les entreprises du parc industriel aussi pour euh, donner de la formation aux gens qui travaillent et qui n'ont pas nécessairement le temps de se rendre justement à Montréal pour obtenir cette amélioration de, de leurs connaissances. Donc, c'est le, le projet qu'on travaille en ce moment avec différents collèges et différentes universités. Pour ce qui est euh, de l'économie sociale, moi, je dirais que les municipalités n'ont pas à tout faire. Les citoyens sont là pour et ont beaucoup de pouvoir. Ce n'est pas au, au pouvoir municipal de faire tout dans les municipalités. Les, les, on peut accompagner, faciliter, mais les citoyens ont une grande part de cette, cette énergie, de cette innovation. C'est notre plus grande richesse et euh, je crois que l'économie sociale se porte bien justement parce que euh, on est là pour les accompagner avec les différents euh, les différents euh, paliers gouvernementaux aussi qui s'intéressent à l'économie sociale. En ce qui a trait à la religion, euh, on, on ne, on ne s'ingère pas dans la religion. C'est un champ qui est euh, personnel à chacun. Toutefois, je peux dire que là où le zonage le permet, euh, il y a des mosquées ou euh, des églises qui s'installent. Ça se transforme. On a maintenant des messes en espagnol une fois par mois parce qu'on a une, com une communauté latino-américaine qui est importante. Donc, euh, et les latino-américaines se promènent. Ils vont même jusqu'à euh, faire des messes à Ganawagé, la réserve amérindienne qui est juste à côté de chez nous. Donc, il y a des échanges comme ça qui se font. Et euh, il y a aussi pour... Euh, célébrer la diversité euh, culturelle, ben, tous les événements qu'on a, les fêtes de la famille, les fêtes nationales, où justement les gens peuvent tenir des kiosques, se rencontrer, expliquer d'où ils viennent, euh, souligner les, leurs fêtes qui sont importantes dans l'année aussi. Alors, on essaie de les accompagner dans tout ça. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. I'd like to, I'd like to thank each mayor, Mayor Bonnie Crombie, Mayor Mark Haycheck, Mayor Dan Matheson, Mayor Mike Savage, and the Mayoress Nathalie Simon. Did I get your name right? No, no, no. <laughs> for being here, for being here today, for great um, input. I hope that you're walking away with some really great ideas. The break, which was supposed to be 15 minutes, will now. <laughs> so, the break will be a maximum of 10 minutes long. Thank you.